So today we're going to begin our journey into the world of kinetics and rate law. When we talk about chem chemical kinetics, we're talking about studying how chemical reactions occur, the steps or mechanisms they occur in, and also how fast they're reacting. And there are factors that affect how fast these reactions occur or the reaction rate, nature of the reactants, what exactly are you reacting? Some substances are just more reactive than others. Fluorine, for instance, incredibly reactive. Um, surface area, the more surface area you've got, the faster the reaction is going to occur. These are all Chem 1 concepts, so I'm just briefly mentioning them again. The more surface area you've got, you simply got more places for other particles to come in and react with that particular substance. The concentration of reactants, if you've got a dilute acid, for instance, that's only maybe 0.1 molar, it's not going to react nearly as fast as concentrated 12 molar hydrochloric acids. So the concentration is going to make a difference. Temperature, the faster the particles are moving, the higher the temperature, the, in general, the faster that reaction is going to occur. And then, then, of course, we have catalysts, those substances that are involved in the chemical reaction, but they themselves are not changed. So um, those are the different factors that are going to, going to affect these reaction rates. Now, the rate of reaction can be measured a couple of different ways. We can measure it as a decrease in concentration of reactant per unit time. Because if you think about it, the reactants are constantly re reacting and they are going away, if you will, disappearing um, and turning into the product. So we can also talk about it in terms of how fast the concentration of a product is increasing. And we always determine rate. In determine rate in terms of its in, the initial reaction rate of that particular chemical reaction. And the way that we do that, let's say we have this particular reaction where A is reacting with two Bs, one mole of A for every two moles of B, and when they react, they're going to form one mole of C and one mole of D. Now, the way we think about this is in terms of, again, reactants disappearing. So reactants are always going to have a negative value when we talk about their rate. They're disappearing. And the products are going to have a positive value. They're appearing. They're increasing in concentration as the reaction proceeds. We talk, again, about rate in terms of the amount of change in the reactant per change in time, negative for our reactants, positive for our products. And we can get relative rates of our substances from a balanced chemical equation. And we use what we use are the coefficients, but what we do is use their coefficients. So if you think about it, if it takes four moles of pH3 to react to produce one mole of P4 and six moles of H2, then think about it. The formation of P4 is going to be one-sixth as fast as the formation of H2. We're going to use the coefficients, but we're going to use the reciprocal of the coefficients. So as pH P4 is forming, we get six H2s. So the formation of P4 is one-sixth the formation of H2. So that, that's where our coefficients are coming in. That's how they do it. So positive one-sixth for the rate of H2, positive 1 over 1, or just 1 P4, and negative 1 fourth for our reaction rate for pH3. So we can set up any equivalence term. We can say that negative 1 fourth, the rate of change in pH3 is equal to the rate of change of P4. Or we can say 
negative one fourth the rate of change of pH three is equal to one sixth the rate of change of H two, we can set up any equivalency statement between any two of these terms. And that's exactly what we're going to do if they ask us to come up with an initial reaction rate for one of these relative to another. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's look at this next problem. It might ask you something like this. For the reaction below, what is the rate of C with respect to B? To just practice at the beginning, Go ahead and put negative on our reactants and positive on our products. Get the coefficient, but get the reciprocal of that coefficient. So this is going to be 1 over 1. This one's going to be 1 over 3, both of them negative. And then our product is going to be positive 1 over 4. So we could say that negative the, the negative rate of change of A, change in concentration over change in time, is equal to negative one-third of the rate of change in B. And it's probably a good idea to go ahead and put brackets around these just to indicate that we're talking about concentration. And I really should have had a should have had a delta in front of that B. So let's do that really quick. Height of change in B. And that's equal to positive one fourth of the change in concentration of C per unit time, per time, change in time. So positive one fourth the rate of change in C. But now what is it asking us to find? It's asking us to find the rate of change of C with respect to B. So we're finding C, so that's the one that's going to go first. So we've got one-fourth of the rate of change of C per time, change in time. And we want it with respect to B, so that we're going to set those two equal to each other, negative one-third the rate of change of B per unit time. And now we're simply going to solve for C. It wants the rate of change in C. So how do we solve for C? If we've got the rate of change in C is equal to, and in order to get rid of this one-fourth, what are we going to do? We're going to multiply both sides by 4 over 1, right? Which is going to cancel or reduce that side to 1. If we multiply this side by 4 over 1, then we end up with the rate of change of C being equal to negative four-thirds the rate of change of B and that's our answer. Now shortcut, I, I want you to write it the way I've shown it here but there's a shortcut you might see for how you would write that, the rate of C, the rate of the change of C is going to be equal to negative four-thirds the rate of change in B. And again, that's one way of writing it, but most of the time I see AP writing it like this. So I, it's a little more complex looking statement and I want you to be familiar with seeing that. Okay, so for the next part, this one asks you to find the rate of change in ammonia with respect to the rate of change in hydrogen. So Again, marking both of our product, excuse me, reactants as negative and our product as positive. This one's going to be 1 over 1, this one 1 over 3, this one 1 over 2. And we want NH3. So we're going to set that one first. Let me try that again because I really want to do concentration. So our 
one half the rate of change in NH3 is equal to negative, we want it in terms of H2, so negative one third of the rate of change in H2. So remembering to put those deltas and those symbols, you've got to practice doing that. So when we solve for NH3, we need to multiply both sides by 2 over 1. So what we end up with, it cancels over here or reduces to 1, that the rate of change in NH3 is equal to negative 2 thirds the rate of change in H2. So that's what we want for this. So that gives us our initial change, relative rate. When we write, next of all, a differential rate law, a differential rate law, the general form, um, it comes from the reaction. In this case, the small a and small b are referring to coefficients. So some number of a molecule or particle plus some number of b is going to yield some number of x. In order to get the rate, general rate law expression, just the general one, we don't know any numbers yet, we're simply going to write this statement where rate is equal to k, which is a rate constant. We've seen that before. We've seen it when we were dealing with nuclear reactions. It was our decay constant. Well, we're using it again in other reactions besides nuclear ones. Um, concentration of A, concentration of B in moles per liter, when you see those brackets, that's what it refers to. And M, it's just a generic number, we, our letter we use all the time. M is the order of reaction with respect to A, and N is something called the order of reaction with respect to B. Now we're going to talk more in the next set of notes about what order of reaction actually means. Right now, all we want to come up with and be able to do is just come up with this general rate expression for our chemical reaction. So if we were going to do the reaction above, which was N2 plus 3H2 yielding 2NH3, the coefficients mean nothing to us in rate law. We can't use the coefficients for anything. All we're going to do is set this up as a rate expression, and we want initial rate, so we're going to talk about initial rate of disappearance of the reactants. So it's always about the reactants and the reactants only. So the general rate law or rate expression is that rate is equal to K. That's the same thing for every single reaction. Now in this case they actually gave us the substances instead of saying A or B. So concentration at the N2 and we're going to raise that to a power that is going to eventually be the order of this reactant. Now we don't know what that means yet. We're going to take this one step at a time. We're simply going to put an M there. That's just, we're, we're learning, really kind of memorizing a form here. And then our H2, our other reactant, then, is going to be raised to N. M and N are just the letters that are used. Remember the product. We don't do anything with the product. All we're going to be involved with is simply writing um, just this general rate law for today.